does Stern Order Turn look fabulous or what? That's pretty good. So good evening and uh, welcome to the, to the Sammies. Uh, my name is Austin Sarrett. I have the privilege of serving on the Jones Library Board of Trustees. It's really an honor to be here tonight and a thrill to have the opportunity to honor the cultural and literary achievements of our distinguished guests. This is the fifth annual Sammy celebration, and I want to give a shout out to um, uh, FDA and Matt and Claudia, who's... <laughs> There really is nothing worse than premature applause. <laughs> uh, the Sammies was uh, really the brainchild of uh, Matt and Claudia, and they've done amazingly good work with the library uh, and in all their endeavors in town. Tonight we have uh, the privilege of celebrating uh, Madeline Blaze and the Amherst Regional High School Theater Program under the direction of John Bechtold. The theater program is also being represented here tonight by three distinguished participants, Cecilia duville Bodin, Zach Ellis, and I know I'm going to get it wrong, Louis Triggs. Yes. Way to go. Through their contributions to the written word and to the uh, nurturing of a vibrant artistic life in our educational institutions, these distinguished individuals um, enrich our community. You'll hear more about them in a few minutes. But let me say that the Jones Library Board of Trustees and staff are absolutely delighted to publicly recognize uh, their extraordinary talents and commitments. And let me say on behalf of the Board of Trustees a special thanks to the staff of the Jones And to all of the volunteers that make the Sammies a, a wonderful moment to celebrate uh, Amherst's three great libraries. The Sammies give us an opportunity once a year to come together and to reflect on the meaning of the libraries to this town. And the meaning of our libraries to this town are quite profound. Um, I've said in the past and believe that our libraries are places of hope. They're places that knit our community together and that offer opportunities for mixing of ages and classes and backgrounds uh, that are unparalleled elsewhere in the town. The libraries bring our town together and they preserve our past and they point us towards the future. And each of them is loved in its own way. The Jones, as you know, is one of the busiest libraries in the state of Massachusetts. The North Amherst Library and the Munson play critical roles in their communities and in their neighborhoods. But as I said, we're here tonight to celebrate these libraries and to present the fifth annual Samuel Minot Jones Awards for Literary Achievement. As you know, we finally call these awards the Sammies. These awards are presented annually to members of our community who make a difference in the lives of all of us who treasure the written word and who believe that Amherst is an extraordinary place to be and to live in part because it is a community that treasures the arts. There are many volunteers and donors to thank. I want especially to recognize our primary underwriter, People's Bank. critical role in the Sammy since its inception. We're extremely great, grateful to our main sponsors, Barry Roberts and TD Bank. Uh, other event sponsors include Amherst College, the Davis Financial Group, the Financial Development a Agency, Feingold Alexander Architects, Greenfield Savings Bank, Hampshire College, Pascucci and Tezera, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, 
we come together to celebrate, but I need to introduce uh, a sad note. Uh, Coach Ron Moyer has suffered a family tragedy. His daughter Kristen died unexpectedly on Tuesday. Please join me in a moment of silence and remembrance. Thank you. Coach Moria, as you know, played a, a central role in uh, Madeline Blaze's uh, book. So as we celebrate Madeline's distinguished achievement, um, we note this absence in our midst. OK, one other note. After we conclude the awards presentation, we hope that you will join our honorees and Mika Archer the talented illustrator who created this year's Sammy's Art Print here on stage for a book signing. Books are available for purchase in the library, thanks to Nat Harold and Am excuse me, they're available for purchase in the lobby, <laughs> thanks to Nat Harold and uh, Amherst Books, another of Amherst's jewels. Um, and once you've had your book signed, please enjoy coffee and a chocolate confection on the patio. <laughs> Okay, in lieu of our state representative who could not make it tonight, I'm pleased to call to the stage Louis Triggs. So Solomon doesn't normally write down uh, his speeches beforehand, but he's done so for us tonight since he can't be here. And he begins with a parenthetical, uh, which includes a quote. So, from a practical handbook for the actor, the theatre may now be the only place in society where people can go to hear the truth. <laughs> School in the end is about teaching our children how to live in the world, thoughtfully, knowledgeably, and genuinely. Despite the importance of academic subjects, there are few enterprises that cut to the core of what it even means to be human the way theatre does. I have known John Bechtold and the ARHS Theatre Company since I myself was at ARHS. I learnt more about myself than I would have ever guessed I might by being in the cast of a semi-immersive A Midsummer Night's Dream. That experience and the theatre training I did in college because of it gave me the communication skills to run for state rep. But I've also seen firsthand how the ARHS theatre program gives every student it touches similar skills and much needed confidence. In politics, as in theatre, communication is everything. But communication is crucially important for almost any route one might take through life. If ARHS alumni are to get internships and jobs, they need strong interviewing skills. To get anyone to have confidence in them, they need to have confidence in themselves. For those increasing number who seek social change, they can only get their ideas taken seriously if they project confidence in their ideas as well. Theatre also promotes team working skills, particularly in the context of ARHS's programme. John gives students incredible flexibility and room for self-direction, and our students learn far more through that kind of empowerment than they ever would if given strict instruction or rote memorization. The fact that students were able to run aspects of the programme during Bechtold's recent sabbatical speaks to that extra level of leadership he possesses. Not only being able to bring a programme to great accomplishments or to have an individual impact as a mentor, but to successfully train others to do the same. Some of the most confident, active and effective communicators I have seen at ARHS in recent years have been involved with the theatre company. That means an incredible amount for our community and for our community's impact on the world. Aside from which, ARHS actors and techies never fail to put on spectacular shows. Some directed by students, some making both actors and audience rethink the physical space of ARHS itself, some incorporating more than 100 kids in various avenues of involvement. This isn't only useful educationally. The shows Bechtold and his students put on often have the potential to make audience community members think differently, feel inspired, Increase, increase their connection to the aspects of the world they find meaningful 
and in this way, the programme is a gift to Amherst and the literary community. Thank you all for being here tonight to support literary endeavours such as this, and please give a huge round of applause to one of our stars, John Bechtel. <laughs> First, I want to thank Louis for standing in for Solomon, and I think you can see already um, uh, the effects of Solomon's words on, on the, that wonderful uh, speech there. And I wish Solomon was with us. He was a, a member of the theater company, as he mentioned, and I, I love uh, the last uh, fleeting image I, of I, that I saw of him in the theater company was as a fairy in A Midsummer Night's Dream that he <laughs> named himself Clover. <laughs> And uh, he was prancing around the kind of middle courtyard of the school. And whenever I see him in state representative mode, that's the image that flashes back in my mind. So thank you. It's an honor to accept an award from the biggest contributor in literary culture in our community, the Jones Library. While tonight's program does focus on the awardees, our hosts giving this award are the reason that we are all here to begin with. We're incredibly lucky to have such wonderful people and such a wonderful place as a cultural cornerstone in Amherst. Before I introduce these three members of the theater company that have come along with me, I wanted to share our plan up front. While we pride ourselves on the wide array of productions that we create each year at ARHS, everything we do actually comes from a pretty similar process. First, we come up with an idea for a production that we get overexcited about. <laughs> then, partway through our work, we realize that we have no real idea what we're doing. <laughs> then, we cross our fingers and try to climb our way out of the myriad problems we've created for ourselves. <laughs> and then finally, we spend much of opening night wondering how it all managed to work out so damn well. In other words, the model for the theater company is essentially theater, a place where skill and serendipity go hand in hand. <laughs> so we thought we'd embrace that spirit tonight in these speeches. I brought with me three veterans of the theater company, our student technical, uh, technical director, uh, Zach Ellis. <laughs> Louis Triggs, a playwright, an actor, and also a director who directed a full-scale production of Henry IV, part one, while I was away. <laughs> And Celia Duville Bodwin, an accomplished musical and immersive theater actor who also served as the dramaturg for the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, this year's winter musical. <laughs> We've agreed to split up our speaking time and share our experiences with the theater company, with each of us including the following components to our speeches. Number one, we had to include an anecdote from an ARHS show. Number two, a personal realization you have had along the way. Number three, a sweeping generalization <laughs> about theater kids. And then number four, and very importantly, a reference to our mascot. His name is Silas. He is a taxidermied creature that looks like a raccoon, but we know it's not a raccoon, but he makes his way into the set and design of every one of our plays and shows up somewhere. And finally, we agreed that we would not share with each other what we were about to say, nor the order in which we were going to speak. So, uh, with that skill and serendipity, let me get out of the way and introduce any one of the three students here. <laughs> member is handed a suitcase, entirely without explanation. They walk up a brightly lit hallway and are met by a stern-faced, uniformed actor behind a desk. This officer begins to poke through the luggage and question the bewildered audience member. First name? Last name? Did you pack this yourself? Was this your first time traveling outside the country? What was the nature of your trip? The audience member tries to answer, investing a inventing a destination and improvising on the spot, but the TSA officer has spotted something suspicious in the luggage. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to come with me, they snap, and roughly escort the audience member out of the hallway and into an entirely different scene. The whole thing is done in less than three minutes. I was the TSA officer, and that was my very first performance with the ARHS Theatre Company. 
The show is called Bing Bong, a piece of immersive theater in which the audience find themselves hopping from scene to scene all around the school, always thrown right into the center of the action. At one point, you step into a classroom and are st suddenly being treated like a daytime television host, live on air with a teleprompter. Minutes later, you're being chased by a pack of hungry zombies down a dark hallway. Silas was lurking in a tunnel near the end of the show, for anyone wondering. <laughs> Putting on a production as logistically complex as this requires an immense amount of trust, both among scene partners and the cast as a whole. The timing had to be perfect, so every single actor was responsible for their own corner of the show. It, it was a wonderful thing to have such trust placed upon me from the very beginning, and it immediately made me feel like a valued member of the company. There's this idea that theater kids are selfish divas, always vying for the spotlight. Um, but my very first production showed me that this is not only untrue, but impossible for the work that we do. Performances like Bing Bong simply could not happen if the people involved weren't as generous, humble, and community-driven as they are. I'm endlessly grateful for the experiences I've had in my three years with the company and to represent such a fantastic group of artists here tonight. Thank you so much. People involved in theater are extraordinarily predisposed towards dissent and squabbling. <laughs> Last autumn, when I was directing Henry IV Part One, all hell broke loose in one nightmare of a rehearsal as actors grew frustrated with one another and eventually lost their tempers. I promise you it wasn't my fault. <laughs> and as I was trying to reconcile the bickering actors and re-civilize the ARHS Theatre Company, all sorts of other problems emerged, from fight choreography to eyeliner. And finally, the prop master came in in the midst of the maelstrom and asked how we're going to fit Silas in. Which could have been the last straw, but actually put things in perspective. The tension just drained out of me, and I was in a position to carry on the rehearsal as normal. I think that Silas's soothing effect is linked to a broader culture in the theatre company that I only came to recognise last year, when on the Saturday night we performed Anything Goes for the fourth and final time. <laughs> Beck had typecast me as the dressing gown clad English aristocrat and similarly <laughs> typecast my good friend Doug as a hopelessly incompetent criminal <laughs> who burst into my suite in a poorly constructed attempt to frame me and then wandered slightly from the script using the telephone on the dresser to demonstrate to Lord Evelyn his inability to grasp the gravity of the situation. His point made, he slammed the telephone down into its cradle at which point it went ding and together on stage in front of hundreds of fairly discriminating audience members, we burst out laughing. And the, and the audience applauded over us, kindly accepting a moment of unprofessionalism as an opportunity for learning and an indicator of the live sincerity of the show. And this was my realization, that despite the high standards of quality that the theatre company sets for itself, there is fond memory in failure. If we approach what we do in goodwill, then whether we fail or succeed, we can still create something genuinely enriching for both the audience and everyone involved. For me, it's this spirit that makes the ARHS Theatre Company special. Not only does it enable us to innovate and experiment with dramatic art, it enables us to come together and form a community that together is capable of great things, and perhaps more importantly, goes far beyond what happens on the stage itself. Thank you. Earlier this year, on the last night of the musical, as I walked off stage from taking my final bow as part of an RHS musical, I started crying. My backstage techies, who I grew to love like family, gathered around me in a big group hug. At that moment, I was filled with a new mix of emotions, including pride and joy that I did not know, cannot explain, and am like, unlikely to feel again. The amount of work, passion, blood, sweat, and tears that the students of RHS put into every single production is really remarkable. As tech director, I'm probably Beck's only real competition when it comes to hours spent at the high school. Um, there have been so many nights where it's just been me, him, and Silas working away, um, and so many nights when I've come home to mountains of homework. It's so late, but I really wouldn't trade any of it. Um, the stress of the musical is just so huge, but it's unlike anything else. Um, so, I've learned more about myself in the past year than I thought possible. 
From the beginning of the year when Beck was on sabbatical, leaving me and a few other students to lead the spirit of the theater company in his absence, to the musical, when, it, as it is always, stress-inducing and a giant beast of a project. Um, Amherst Theater Company has given me leadership skills, confidence, creativity, passion, and drive that could come from nowhere else in the school. That's what Eritus Theater is. It isn't just an activity, it's a community. It's a commitment, and it's the experience of being part of something far bigger than yourself. Every single year, we put on not one or two, but six individual productions that give students from all walks of life in the school a chance to be part of, of this incredible community that I call home. And as I, along with many of the other seniors in the theater company, prepare to leave, we can go knowing that one, we are not truly leaving it behind because once a theater kid, always a theater kid. And two, that we are leaving it in good hands. The people at RHS change, but the spirit and community of the RHS Theater Company does not. So at this point, you might be asking yourselves, with students as articulate as this, who needs the adults? <laughs> There's more than a grain of truth to that. Theater students, contrary to popular cliches, are not all a bunch of loud, extroverted teenagers that have group sing-alongs to Hamilton in the school hallways. <laughs> that is some of them, but it's not quite all. Rather, at ARHS, a theater kid is anyone who has managed to find their way into the auditorium and feels like they've somehow found home. Productions, after all, are ephemeral things. Our set builders learn early on, you build with screws, not nails, because that thing's coming down in a few weeks. That means a space like the ARHS Auditorium becomes a pileup of ghosts from shows and students past. Their names are painted on the cinder block walls backstage. Layers of paint on the stage floor conceal countless productions before them, like the layers of history under an old city. And the memories of students come and gone, show here for decades and decades, and continue to accrue with each new year as our faithful mascot, Silas, watching them all pass through the stage wings. This weekend, in fact, we are producing Sarah Rule's Melancholy Play, a student-directed work dedicated to exploring the complex layers of that complex emotion. I heard one student describe that emotion as a, quote, kind of happy sadness, like how I felt after Spelling Bee this year, the school musical. I remember telling that student during the musical that their job in a particular scene was to find the physical version of what their character was feeling internally after they realized that the word they spelled was wrong and that they were suddenly out of the B. They then asked me, well, can I just use what I feel whenever it's a Monday morning and the show is just closed and I come into the auditorium and see a blank stage? I said, yes, of course, knowing instinctively that what they meant by that particular feeling was very unique to anyone that has done theater. For our students, the acknowledgement of making a, quote, significantly literary contribution to the community is an incredible thing, and we thank you so much for it. It suggests that there is some relationship between the deeply felt experience that we've all had making work and the experience of an audience member who may or may not have any direct connection to us, experience what they came and saw when they encountered the work with all, all of us behind it. That's validating on two important levels. Maybe it sums up what we all hope for in the ARHS Theater Company and what it can be. Somewhere inspiring internally and externally. A creative and emotional home base. An incubator for strange and wonderful ideas. And ultimately, a means of being a part of a world far bigger than yourself. So thank you. On behalf of the hundreds and hundreds of ARHS students from these many years for this honor. Many that have preceded the four of us and the sense that what they've done carries meaning far beyond what they would expect. anything that would make me want to go back to high school. <laughs> I want so much to go back now. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure now to introduce Judge Michael Ponzer. 
Judge Ponzer will present the Sammy for Local Literary Achievement to Madeline Blaze. Judge Ponzer was, bo was born in Chicago. He's a Rhodes Scholar, he has his law degree from Yale. He served on the federal district bench since 1994, and he's the author of two novels, The Hanging Judge, and a novel published in 2017, The One-Eyed Judge. He lives in Amherst, and he continues his judicial duties while working on his next novel. Please join me in welcoming Judge <laughs> I think there's an old uh, vaudeville uh, uh, saying it, never follow a child to the podium. Uh, this uh, was fantastic, and certainly never follow three attractive, intensely magnetic, and articulate young people to the podium. But I will try to do the best I can. I feel like a rye crisp coming out after a slice of chocolate cake. <laughs> to be here tonight. This is so much more fun than putting people in prison. I cannot <laughs> I am the luckiest person in the world, particularly because I get to actually give my dear friend Madeline Blaze her award. I'm going to keep my remarks to just a few minutes, but I want to touch on three things. First, I want to talk about the Sammies themselves and the Jones. Second, I want to uh, touch on what is perhaps an old, overlooked gold star in Maddie's writing career that was not mentioned in the program. And third, I want to highlight a special quality in Maddie's superb writing that I cannot pass up the opportunity to praise. Okay, first, the Sammy. Uh, we're here uh, tonight, obviously, to honor Maddie Blaze and this wonderful Amherst Regional High School theater program, and that's terrific. But we're also here to support the Jones Library, our own Amherst Library, now almost a century old. In a time when so much seems to be pulling our nation apart, and sometimes even our community, a local library like the Jones pulls people together. I They're like little embers in a community radiating warmth, pulling in all sorts of different people. And I've given a lot of talks in libraries around the state, and they're all like that. They're vibrant. They are essential uh, to a community. So critical, so precious. And we owe them our support. Uh, financial? It's got to be on everybody's donation list every year. Doesn't have to be a lot, but do it. Do it. There's no excuse. Everybody can afford something. And I'm so pleased to hear that a renovation of the Amherst Library is in the works. Support it. It's important. It's a good thing to do. that I visited has the same pattern, the old, beautiful, center of the library, which is preserved, and then a large, efficient, airy, complimentary wing. We need that in Amherst. We deserve that in Amherst. Our community deserves it, and I hope people will support it. That's my first <laughs> Second, Maddie's uh, gold star. I don't know if she was just being modest or if this was overlooked, but I should point out that Madeline Blaze is a Pulitzer Prize winner. It's not in your program. In 1980, she won the prize for a feature article that she wrote for the Miami Herald called Zepp's Last Stand. Pulitzer Prizes do not come out of cracker boxes. They only give out 25 a year, and they give one for a feature article, and she got it in 1980. <laughs> give you a, a, an idea, a, a guess who won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1980? It was Norman Mailer's novel, Executioner's Song. Now, I have tried to read Mr. Mailer's book. 
And I've read Maddie's piece on uh, Mr. Zepp. And I strongly recommend that if you have to choose between the two, <laughs> go with Maddie's piece. It's shorter. It's a lot better. You'll get everything out of it that you would have gotten out of reading the execution. So. <laughs> that brings me to my final point. Uh, Zepp's last stand, like all of Maddie's writing, is brilliant. It tells the tale of a World War I veteran who was discharged dishonorably in 1919 and spent the rest of his life trying to get that stain removed from his record. And she follows Mr. Zepp on a train ride from Florida to the Pentagon where he makes an appearance before the uh, board or whatever it is, group of people, who have the power to turn his dishonorable discharge into an honorable discharge. And I'm just going to read you a paragraph from Zepp's Last Stand. You can get it on Google. You just have to Google Zepp's Last Stand. It's a great read. And see how she uses physical objects and physical details to convey emotion and biography. This is just a short paragraph, and she's describing Mr. Zepp, this 80-year-old man going up to Washington to make his case to the Pentagon to try to get this uh, dishonorable distinction or dishonorable badge of shame removed from his record. The old man, wearing a carefully chosen business suit, which he hoped would be appropriately subdued for the Pentagon, sat in the chair of his roomette as the train pulled out of Deerfield Beach. With a certain palsied eagerness, he forged his briefcase. I love that. Before the train reached full speed, he arranged on his lap the relics from his days at war. There were the dog tags and draft card, and even his Department of War Risk life insurance policy. There was a letter to his mother, written in 1919 in France, explaining why he was in the stockade. His fingers, curled with arthritis and in pain, attacked several documents. He unfurled the pages of a copy of the original court-martial proceedings, which found him in violation of the 64th Article of War, failure to obey the command of a superior officer. There was also a copy of the rule book for Fort Leavenworth, where Zepp had been sentenced to 10 years of hard labor. Wow, a paragraph that delivers such punch and such richness and tells us so much both about the emotional character of the individual she describes and the individual's context. This is Maddie Blaze to a T. Whether she's writing about girls at Amherst Regional High School finding the character to battle for the state basketball championship or about the struggles of her widowed mother with a large family or any of the other scenes she paints so beautifully, she has the generosity of spirit and the verbal adroitness to place us in the mind and the heart of another person and another situation. This is the most essential and most profound magic that art can produce, and Madeline Blaze performs it consummately. It's a gift to read her, it's a great pleasure to know her, and it's really fun to introduce her. And here she is, Madeline Blaze. <laughs> Michael to perform this honor. He was very good about accepting it readily. But I said to him two things. Don't make me blush and don't make me cry. <laughs> Judges never like getting orders. <laughs> I was particularly thrilled to have him come before you because I love his late in life career. Hope is the person who gets his first novel published after the age of 50. <laughs> uh, and Although he is used in his career as a, as a, as a judge, uh, in, used to imposing sentences, trust me, he now composes very imposing sentences. <laughs> I also uh, want to give a shout out to Ron Moyer. I know he planned to be here. He 
really, when you write a book as an author, the one thing you can do is say, finally, mine. I did it. I wrote a book. In the case of In These Girls, actually, Ron and I, I think, are the co-authors on some level. He, he is the heart and soul of that book. And because of the way he is in this world, he helped expose the best of Amherst, the best of its heart and soul, I believe, in that story. So we especially miss his presence this evening. I was going to make a couple of jokes. If he were here, I talked to his wife this afternoon. She said, go ahead and make them, but I can't, so I won't. I want to also say thank you, John. John uh, runs a, a theater arts camp at Deerfield that many of you are familiar with. My daughter went there as a camper for several years in a row and then became a counselor. And due to John, when she went to college, what did she major in? Theater. So she's now an educator, and she feels that that is the best preparation for what she does. So thank you. So, right now, I'd like you to travel with me a mere 10 miles across the notch to the center of Granby, Massachusetts. I'd like you to go back in time, 40, 50, 60 years. And I'd like you to visit my childhood library, which was literally across the street from the house I grew up in, an old center staircase colonial. This library was built in 1917 to the tune of $5,000. It was part of the Carnegie Foundation's effort to bring libraries to small towns in America so that you didn't have to live in a big city to be able to get books. It's a beautiful building. It is uh, praised often for its Greek and Roman influences, which I can trust you when I was growing up, you can trust me when I was growing up in Granby, those influences sounded very hypothetical and hardly a compliment. This was a town that takes its cow pastures and the price of corn seriously. So talking about Greece and Rome seemed a little bit affected. The building is a very balanced building. It's uh, two stories. When we were children, it had two librarians. It was only open two days a week. Uh, the librarians are the people I want to introduce you to right now. But before I do, I want to also say that that, uh, that the upstairs of the library had a long honey-colored table, a reading table in the middle. It had stuffed birds in glass cages, which were not as airy and inviting as I might have liked. The downstairs, the basement, was where the children's room was, where, we, where our collection was housed. And this is the place where when you walked in on the right, there were picture books, and then on the left, there were books without pictures. And you knew you would become a more sophisticated reader when you could say with swagger, I'll take that one without the pictures. <laughs> this is where I got to meet Hans Brinker and Heidi and Mary Lennox, and thus travel to Holland, the Alps, and cholera-ridden India. There is no frigate like. Two tragically ancient women, my age now, served as the librarians. And their names are perfect for New England, high New England in my opinion. Miss Gertrude Taylor, who lived next door to us, and Miss Winifred Fisk, who lived up the street. <laughs> Miss Taylor had grown up in Granby. She went to Framingham Normal School, and after that, she spent her, the entire, entirety of her working career as a teacher in New Jersey. By the standards of the day, as a woman on her own, leaving not just her hometown, but also her home state, she qualified as a mad adventuress. She was stout. Her visage fit a description I once read in a book supplied by her, I suspect, of someone whose face possessed a staircase of double chins. <laughs> if Miss Taylor had a streak of excess, it was in the profusion of African violets throughout her small sloping home and in the mink stole, which she wore once a year when she joined our family on Christmas Eve. On that occasion, she brought a big box of wonderful homemade candy, which we, of course, had ransacked by the next morning. When we squabbled, there were six children in my family born within nine years of each other, so we inevitably did squabble. Miss Taylor offered old school Yankee wisdom, least said, soonest mended. Born in 1888, Miss Winifred Fisk left Granby to go to Middlebury College, from which she graduated in 1912. She thought about becoming a teacher, but she was too shy and decided to pursue a career as a librarian in Holyoke, Massachusetts. She lived up the street in a house that was multi-generational, which means that it included her grandniece and grandnephew, our childhood friends, Eileen and Brian. We were in and out of her house, and we were allowed to address her as Aunt Wynne. 
She lived in a navy blue suit, jacket, and skirt with an ivory white blouse with a small collar. In Aunt Lynn's bedroom was a long, narrow mirror into which we sometimes glimpsed her, fretfully checking to make sure her slip was not showing. <laughs> Children make the best spies. <laughs> she was known to have uttered only one swear word in her life when something had happened with the insurance and it didn't work out, and she said, damn. <laughs> Brian and Eileen tried to get her to be more up-to-date. Children are always trying to modernize their elders, and they got her one time to watch the Ed Sullivan show when, J when Jim Morrison and the Doors were performing. <laughs> you know that it would be untrue. You know I'd be a liar if I was to say anyway. <laughs> After the show, Aunt Wynne, who loved barbershop quartets, said, it's too bad people don't do harmony anymore. <laughs> Just as a footnote, the sponsors of the Ed Sullivan Show tried to get the Doors to change the lyrics to, Girl, You Couldn't Get Much Sweeter. <laughs> the Doors agreed, and then, of course, when they performed, they changed their mind, thus getting them banned from Ed Sullivan forever. <laughs> Aunt Wynne was just as old-fashioned as Miss Taylor, maybe more so, because she had never even lived in New Jersey. <laughs> These women were not rabble-rousers. Aunt Wynne consistently supported Republican candidates, and Miss Taylor, when she died at the age of 98, left her modest savings to the United Church of Christ in the center of town. There were bastions of outward propriety, but they knew a reader when they saw one, and knew on some level that literature occupies that slippery, shadowy, destabilized place where indeed people often don't do harmony, and it is rarely a case of least said, soonest mended. Aunt Wynne mostly read westerns, but for some reason she loved Withering Heights. She pressed a copy on me while Miss Taylor nodded, chins quivering, in approval. I was in about the seventh grade. Of course I devoured the book, but afterwards I did wonder, had they read it? In Withering, in Withering Heights, people's slips are showing, and how? By the time I was in high school, I had moved exclusively upstairs, and these women took to saving for me many of the new releases, the freshly minted hardbacks that crackle with their own anticipation when they're opened. You know that sound. Everyone in this room knows that sound. And thus, as a result, I got familiar with Early Updike, Middle Malamud, the Bokhoff's Pale Fire, of which I understood not a single line. <laughs> But of more promise to me as a reader was Flannery O'Connor's collection of short stories. O'Connor, who hailed from a farm with peacocks in Georgia and who believed, the truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it. Her character specialized in conveying that drumbeat of insider information that binds a small town, the gossipy postmistress, the irksome, garrulous grandma. You mean you can write about that? It would be easy to dismiss Miss Taylor and Aunt Wynne as meek or call them old maids, but they were, in their own way, ferocious. They understood, as Muriel Reichhauser once put it, the universe is made up not of atoms, but of stories. I feel I owe them my livelihood, perhaps even my existence, in the way they stood guard over my burgeoning intellect when I was the age of these young people in the first row here. They gave me the keys to the kingdom, and this is what we are celebrating this evening, every day across this country, in big cities and in small towns. Librarians are creating the same everyday miracle for patrons young and old. To quote St. Kurt Vonnegut, <laughs> The America I love still exists at the front desks of our public libraries. So thank you. of cynicism left in this room. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the leader of the Amherst Libraries, 
So uh, Amherst is blessed with an extraordinary, dedicated, and talented staff, and is blessed with a leader of our libraries who every day embodies in what she does and says the belief that libraries make a difference. Sharon Cherry is a woman who is not afraid to use the word love. And I think it's time to express a little love for Sharon Cherry. Sharon. <laughs> I do love you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Austin. Oh, and what was that about following students and following Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> authors? Wow. Wow. Maddie, thank you. Thank you. Congratulations again to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have really enjoyed getting to know all of you uh, the past year. And thank you all so much for coming tonight, um, looking out over this crowd. It is so humbling and it, warm and fuzzy, and uh, I will cry. That's what I do. Um, so there's a few p people that I want to thank by name. Uh, first, I want to, again, thank our primary sponsor, People's Bank. Kim and Kathy are here. <laughs> I also want to thank our major sponsors, Barry Roberts and TD Bank. Uh, next, I want to thank Nadine Shank for the music over in the Mead Art Museum. I also want to thank the many community-minded businesses and individuals. So many people have donated to the, to the library, to this event. Uh, to make this happen, including Applewood, Oliver Scott Photography, Judy's Restaurant, I love them, uh, V1 Vodka, Black Birch Vineyards, Building 8 Brewing, The Artifact Cider Project, Whole Foods, and Big Y. Thank you all so much. Special thanks to David Little, Eileen Smith, Danielle Amadeo, and the entire uh, Mead Art Museum staff. Uh, we've been here for three years. We've been celebrating here this event, and uh, it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to be here and to work with these individuals. They're wonderful. A special shout out to Greg Wardlaw. I don't know if he's in the room, I can't tell. And his entire Amherst College catering staff, they are incredible. <laughs> it takes a bunch of people a lot of time to put this event together. Uh, so I wanna take a quick moment to thank the very special Jones Library staff, especially Janet, Linda, Matt, Mia, Roxanne, Lisa, John, Cindy, and George. As well as many community volunteers, especially Claudia, Molly, Tony, Erica, Deb, Elizabeth, Nat, and Will for their valuable work. This event would never happen with all of these people. I also want to thank the Jones Library Board of Trustees. I say this a lot, but I mean it with all of my heart and soul. Their support and dedication and passion. Uh, they're not just in this because they like to come to a meeting once a month. Uh, they really care so deeply about this town, about this library, about library services, about the patrons in this, in this town. Um, and they are really so, uh, dedicated to supporting the staff. And so on behalf of the staff, I thank all of the trustees for their support. I also want to quickly thank my daughter, Molly. This is her first Sammy's event. Um, I, I want to thank her for being so supportive of my career. I am very proud of the young lady you have become. And finally, please join me in thanking Misha Archer, the creator of this year's gorgeous art print.
Okay, one last item on our agenda for this evening is our drawing. Yes, everything is in place. Okay, we have three prizes to give away. Two golden tickets to upcoming Amherst Regional High School Theater Productions. <laughs> and one set of autographed books by Madeline Plays. So, I am going to ask... The number is 434-516. The name is Paul Bockelman. There's a random drawing I saw. We will make sure that Paul gets his award. Erica Zikos. You guys, uh, Erica, where, where are you? Uh, you can come up and, and get the envelope after the ceremony. <laughs> and this is for Maddie's prize. She can. Yeah. Is that you? No. No, it's not, but I know her. <laughs> receive exclusive exclusive tours to special collections they'll be contacted in early May to make arrangements so in addition to a tour of special collections featuring some of our treasures these folks will be the first to experience a newly developed tour of our fine arts collection uh, these people are really in for a treat and so if any of you would like to upgrade your ticket to join the tour you can come see me afterwards that's it uh, thank you all again for being here, for supporting the Jones Library for your love. Uh, now please join the honorees, Misha Archer, here on stage. If you'd like a book signed uh, or to congratulate them in person, they'd love to talk with you and then enjoy coffee and chocolate outside. Thank you all so much.